This year, Southeast Asia's most iconic thought leaders and innovators came together for the inaugural Summit X. It's time for an exclusive insight into the latest development in the Web3 scene and how the metaverse, the esports scene, and venture capital play parts in this new ecosystem. If you want autonomous AI to... In today's landscape, I think we're actually interestingly in accuracy. Metaverse, Bill versus buy. What are your thoughts? I think maybe Don can try to answer that. Kind of an interesting question. Build versus buy. You mean acquire. So at the moment, a lot of this stuff relating to the metaverse is still in its infancy. You have experiments that are happening, of course, with Horizons World, which really hasn't taken off. I spend a lot of time in these spaces, and one of the areas that I see that's really exciting, of course, is gaming. And you see the leaders in this space, obviously the epics of the world, are the ones that are going to really kind of lead what's, what, what it looks like or define what it looks like in the future. And also, of course, providing the tools for those to be able to produce the content for those spaces. If you're looking to uh, evaluate exactly what is going on in there, it's spaces like Reddit, Discord, et cetera, where the communities are gathering, and of course, where the startups are gathering, where the creators are gathering. And they're actually the ones sharing information and knowledge and uh, you know how to build for VR chat. So building, I would connect with those folks. Buying, investing at the moment, a little wary at the moment of really putting money down on the table on that just yet. I think it's investing in your teams internally to be able to understand this space first. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot on the news that, you know, uh, with AI, people are being threatened by losing their jobs, there are strikes. Uh, what's your view on that since you run like a talent, you know, network and talent consultancy? Uh, I must say the conversations uh, recently is actually becoming real. Uh, a CEO of a startup asked me if I could organize a CTO roundtable to discuss how many engineers do we, does each organization really need now that there's co-pilot? So I think the, uh, I myself am thinking about how I'm going to reorganize my team or redesign jobs as well. So I think um, from an employer's perspective or uh, someone who is accountable for P&L, uh, it is a real, a, a real thing that's causing through our minds right now and it will, it will become clearer you know, as time comes. So on the other flip side, I think it's a mindset, right? So do we, are we really going to lose our jobs? I do feel that you know, I think that it's, the, it's the mindset that we need to approach this challenge that's coming. I think AI, as we all know, will simplify our work 100%. But does simplification mean that our jobs will go away? No, right? I mean, we will be able to do better quality things if we look at it that way. Because if we, then if our mindset is that our jobs will go away, then our jobs will go away. But our mindset is that we will be able to do better quality work and be more motivated with the work that we do because we don't have to do all the mundane stuff or in Singapore, Singlish, it will be Sai Kang. You know, we can then do better quality work and more skilled jobs. So I think it's the mindset. Uh, on the other hand, I think about it as it's a challenge for humanity. Right? Because I think in, in the thousands of years, or um, I don't know, millions of years that we've been around, we've never been, we've always been challenged to be better. And I think humans are definitely the po most powerful species. So I feel that um, if, if anything, it just challenges us to be uh, out of our comfort zone. You know? So uh, I am optimistic uh, about the future, and I feel that humans will prevail and will be better humans down the road. That's kind of what I think. All right, so human intelligence versus artificial intelligence. Definitely. <laughs> How do you see regulators, uh, regulations affecting the AI sector? Because now you're running like an agile algo company and trying to convince people that AI is going to make their lives better, but there are people complaining that how do you tell the difference between like, uh, you know, real uh, work done by humans versus something that chat GPT pulled out from, you know, how, how do you do that? Should it be regulated? Um, my first answer is no, it should not be regulated at this point in time, right? Why? Because it's still blooming, right? And um, you need to let it go for a while and see the effect. But if I put on my head um, under the Singapore Computer Society uh, 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 Committee, uh, where we look at AI ethics and governance, we think that there needs to be a view where uh, people need to be aware of the framework on how to think about this, how to be ethical in using uh, AI. 
Um, so there will be things like you know being able to explain what it means. Um, I give you an example. Maybe in, in the HR area, you can have build a model for interview recommendation. Interview recommendation. How do you prevent that recommendation engine from being biased? Right. So it's about being able to understand how do you explain the results that come back uh, for from the engine uh, itself. So it, it is about understanding the framework of how to think about guiding yourself ethically uh, and not making it biased so that you, you end up hiring the wrong people uh, at, at the end of the, the day. Uh, I think that's good enough for now. Yeah, and uh, uh, I think that's what we can see and maybe in future there may be Right, uh, if you're dealing with um, things that can harm somebody. Well, um, just like a follow on to the next question, which is on digital safety, security management. Uh, well, not just the meta metaverse yet, but even in a classical uh, system, right? Maybe, uh, Feda, you can share with people, how do you build a trusted AI platform? Um, you're definitely uh, one of those that, that's able to do that. Um, now, yeah, nowadays people are talking, you know, sort of like AI is growing so powerful. But I think uh, technologies like, uh, you know, blockchain are exactly in urgent need to keep the AI in check because we are looking at trust and incentive and the governance. And I think very few people ever talk about this or getting serious about how to build good governance structure in the uh, AI world and, then, and also in the more decentralized setting, for example, like DAO. Uh, so for example, currently um, I'm working with some SMU law professor on looking at the DAO governance. Um, and there are lots of interesting issues. For example, nowadays AI, when we talk about AI, uh, people are using ChatGPT. But have you thought about if one day uh, opening I say, oh, I'm going to power off chat GPT, right? Uh, then everything is going to be lost. So at least can we build a decentralized chat GPT that nobody can power off, right? So that's an interesting question. And if all the 99% of company are using chat GPT, then in the, in the end, people are going to realize the most important valuable thing that distinguish themselves from others are actually their data. If data now becomes an emergent asset class, how to um, you know, view data differently, not just as input to machine learning model, but for example, as an asset class. Then we need to think about how to evaluate data's value, right? How to data price, pricing data product and model, and how to do auditing, not on finance, but on data auditing. The idea is that if we go to court to say, hey, I haven't authorized your, our, this company to use my data for training, but I suspect you have used my data. So is there an algorithm that can tell whether a model has actually used a piece of data for training and how much benefit have gained from this data? So these are the new questions on the frontier that in academia that we are currently working on, and I think very quickly the industry is going to catch on that. So I think in terms of AI governance and security, the most important thing is, of course, the awareness. People need to, I, I'm going to echo these uh, other panelists, people need to be aware that nowadays, um, on one hand, we want to make AI more and more powerful, but on the other hand, we need to look at these serious governance issues. Um, then we're going to look at real, uh, the real technique, how to govern them. All right, thanks. We have just about a minute left. So whilst we really like to answer all the questions, I hope that the sharing from the panel gives you a little bit of a kickstart on that. So maybe just to close, I'm going to ask every panel member to give you like a one-liner success, road to success uh, in the areas that they take care of. So maybe Don, you start first. I think you have to maintain an open mind. I've got two young sons, uh, age 13 and 10. And it's great to see their progress and development uh, in their local schools here. But uh, I keep reminding them is to try everything and to see where the, you know, in Canada we have this old saying, we have Wayne Gretzky, greatest hockey player ever. It's always about skating to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. And I think that's the most important thing to think about in life. Elena? Uh, curiosity, maybe. I think maybe always have adopt a you know, a cur curious mindset because there, are, there will always be, there's so many changes, right, in the, in the space now. And, you know, if we are dismissive, you know, we'll be losing out on a lot. So just always adopt that curious mindset, a bit of a segue from being open-minded. Tony. Okay. Um, I'm always a consultant at heart. So, you know, change, I thrive on change. So my, my view is change is always going to be a constant. All right, you can see that, you know, ChatGPT is out, you know, only for six months and people are reacting to it. We are even having a conversation right now on it. So, you know, embrace the change, you know. 
All right, Peter. Yeah, so first of all, keep open. The other thing is uh, try to get educated from different sources because nowadays there are so much information flowing around and uh, people always got some misconception about something. So uh, read more, listen to more, and attend more events like this. I think you're going to be helpful. How do we do make it make Web3 onboarding seamless? Mate? That that's like the new norm for us, right? The seed phrase, recovery key, whatsoever. But yeah, I think that isn't designed for the mass. And like, in order to really onboard the mass, I believe we need to create a user experience that sort of they are really used to it. So when they try to onboard Web3, it's just like they're home at Web2. Like they just use their email, create things, maybe set up a password, and then boom. They don't need to worry about the seed phrase. They don't need to worry about like what happened if I lose my seed phrase and password and whatsoever. And that's one of the things that I think seed phrase is probably the first step to onboarding. And then after that, we have a lot more. Like transaction on blockchain is really crazy, right? If you ever go to Etherscan and try to look into the transaction, understanding the transaction log, well, that's, I mean, <laughs> big salute if you really did that. But the thing is, for Web2 users, if you ever use like a online banking system, which I believe all of you did, and then or an e-wallet, I mean, transaction history is really something that's so simple and so basic for any um, value storage like wallet or whatsoever. But when it comes to Web3, suddenly we have to deal with a lot of jargons, a lot of things that we weren't familiar with. So for me, I think in order to really onboard users, we need to make sure make sure they just feel like it's in Web2 like seed phrase, transaction history, sending things. They don't want to know about what's staking, what's swapping. They just want to get work done. So we have to take yeah. out a lot of jargons, get back to the groundwork, and then make sure those things are laid out. Yeah, exactly. Web3 is not about uh, the technology as much as about the values, right? It's more about introducing new ways of building technologies or new tools to actually encourage different values, right? So that's what blockchain and Web3 is trying to do. But to do that, we need new set of technologies. But while you were talking about it, I can see Tan was like not agreeing with it, oh, right? Oh, so yeah, maybe yeah, like maybe you want to point out your opinion. Yeah, on this. I, I agree that uh, <laughs> usability is uh, the single most uh, important thing that we are trying to resolve. Yeah. And I urge all of you to try our wallets because yeah. uh, you get onboarded within three minutes. You know where there's no need for a uh, passphrase, and you know it's just the seamless experience. You know that you you would you would experience from a Web2 application, you know. So it's all guided, it's all um, uh, shepherded, <laughs> and, uh, you, and you get to um, use, uh, I mean, uh, use all the features afforded by a Web3 security. Uh, but apart from that, I think uh, new developments in the area of AA, right? Mm -hmm. Account abstraction is gonna change the dynamics. Right? I mean, we talk about uh, usability, I think, we see AA as potentially being able to, fun to let the wallet function like your bank account. Okay. And I think that, that gives us a, a very um, an exciting area where I see the development uh, moving forward with, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so basically, uh, I'm not an expert in this, but my way of uh, testing if somebody is going to use it, if my mom is going to use it, right? right? So if, I, if it's too technical for my mom, I don't think so anybody is going to use it, yeah, right? So, so in this case, like when we talk, look into this two wallet side, uh, wallets discussion here, it's two end of the spectrum, right? So we talk about uh, browser-based uh, wallet service, and then you talk about a hardware-based uh, wallet service using HSM modules and you know, like all the protected security hardware, right? I, so I have hardware wallets. I had plenty of them over the years. You know, like, but I ended up not really using them. Sitting the, you know, like some of them. Are, so one of them actually died on me, sure, right? Which really exactly freaked me out I because I had some cash in it, and I was like, oh shit, it just died. What do I do now, right? Yeah, piece so, of paper. yeah. So you, you, thank God the piece of paper, right? But now when I actually have both of them on a hardware wallet, and what if the recovery died and the main died as well? Let's okay. say they just both went into a boating accident, right? right? So in this case, that will be one of my fears as well. But still, let's, let's keep that argument aside, right? Let's say that, okay, maybe there are people who will like hardware wallets, people who will not like hardware wallets. Some people will prefer to use browser wallets, and some people will not prefer to use browser wallets because of they want higher level of security. And when you look into uh, having browser wallets, that is somebody who wants to just go up and try things, right? But still, if I need to remember my mnemonic phrases, copy-paste it, and put it somewhere, I'm too lazy to try that, right? 
But then again, there's something new in the market, right? There's people who are trying like uh, digital identity tokens, Magic Link, right? It's trying to do very similar. But then again, that is not secure at all. <laughs> it all takes one uh, upset uh, cloud provider to shut it all down, right? So if let's say tomorrow the government said like, okay, you can't do crypto wallets anymore, AWS shut down the service, few hundred, few million accounts just doesn't work anymore, well, right? So where do we find this balance? There's a, there's a middle option. There's a third option, yeah. which is account abstraction and, and smart contract wallets, right? Yeah. So the idea is, is, that, is that instead of having a wallet, a private key that you control, either on a hardware device or in a browser, it's actually a smart contract that doesn't require a key. And then you move to a concept which is called proof of authority. So basically what you're doing in that case is you're just proving that you are the person who has the authority to control the smart contract wallet, right? And by doing this, you can actually then uh, embrace the Web2 technologies, which then make it easy to onboard. So you can uh, prove your authority by accessing your, your OAuth through Facebook or Google, one of these things that people already do. Or you can prove your authority by using DKIM in email and emailing it and submitting that to a smart contract. Or several other ways. You could, you could potentially pr uh, prove your authority by using your, your biometrics on your smart device, right? On your phone or so on like that. So this is really where the future is going to go. Because once you, can, you move to a, sy a system where you just have to prove that you are the person who has the authority to do it, you can then you basically take that wallet anywhere as long as you can access the blockchain, which is the end goal. Another topic that we want to talk about today is, of course, adoption. But what about the enterprise adoption, right? So maybe, uh, so, so you can see, like today, there's a lot of discussion about all the use cases, you know, like traceability, banking, financing. We keep telling banks to come on board, but nobody's coming, right? <laughs> Everybody is doing POCs after POCs, but not really pilots, right? So what is really stopping them? What are the challenges of onboarding these people up? I can go first. Yeah. Uh, so I think for companies, uh, I think over especially all the big saga happening right in the recent past six months or uh, tons of airdrops that unexpectedly happened to a lot of people as well, but yet they are slammed with uh, potential regulations uh, spotlight. So I think what I'm hearing, maybe less in Singapore, but more like outside, more in the West, uh, a lot of people are just wondering like, what's the accounting treatment, honestly, uh, for various um, on-chain activities. So. If I'm just, you know, I've just been using Blur nonstop, you know, I love it and stuff, but suddenly I'm like, whoa, I have a lot of Blur airdrops. Uh, so anecdotally on the ground when I chat with projects, they don't even claim it yet, even though it's, it, it's actually somewhat, they can liquidate it to turn to actual cash, right? But they, are, they just don't yet, they're just sitting there because they, they just don't know what's the accounting treatment yet. So that's the most extreme, where someone doesn't even touch it, even as a crypto native, because they are just worried of sentiments, I think, from an accounting perspective that's happening. And... Um, I mean, the, the more popular you are, actually, the, the bigger the spotlight on you. Uh, but I think for the smaller ones, you know, seeing all this big news and in the media, you know, if there's any merchant that just wants to use stable coins as a mode of payment, uh, thankfully, I think the rise of crypto payment gateways have come up, you know, so they accept the crypto for you, they still settle the merchant in fiat, you know, there's no difference for the merchant, so that's great. So I would say we've come a long way, right, from a few years ago where it was really still a very exotic thing. And uh, yes, there are still industries that are getting up to speed. Um, I would say the more regulated industries, uh, especially in the field of like asset tokenization, finance, it's the need for regulatory clarity, uh, you know, has to be fulfilled before, um, you know, before uh, these companies can move beyond like a POC, for example. Um, so that's that's a you know regulation. It could be an enabler or it could be a hurdle, depending on you know how far along the the specific jurisdiction is. Having the frameworks in in, in place once once they are in place, it actually uh, it's a huge area of opportunity. And I, I feel like there's a little bit of a, a almost a competition between uh, a number of jurisdictions to be the most like um, you know digital asset friendly. Um, and and but in other areas of enterprise adoption, um, it's it's actually moving quite quickly. Uh, we have a number of use cases um, that are very high throughput. Uh, things like supply chain, um, also um, tokenization of ESG assets, like carbon credits, everything. We aim to be like the, the uh, to maintain the uh, carbon balance sheet of the planet on the on, on Hedera. So. Uh, we are seeing a lot of adoption in that in that aim. I think the the, the maturity of the tooling is also very important uh, because I would I would um, 
uh, you know, of course, it's a, it's a nascent space, right? So um, it's, it's it's almost like you know we're in the, back in the '90s with uh, not enough uh, not enough tooling. But that that also is changing. The past couple of years, you're seeing a lot of uh, very good tools. And also, one of the things that we're trying to do is to make sure there's enough like open source building blocks. Um, so um, you know, decentralized ID framework, uh, you know, tokenization frameworks. Um, uh, yeah, so a, a number of pieces that can be, you know, utilized without having to reinvent the wheel. Sharon, I got an interesting question. How are you guys like a different from Request Finance, Gilded, and the yeah. other guys? Yeah, yeah, good question. So um, Request, I mean, I'm not from that team, but so I'm kind of in a way, uh, <laughs> yeah. hopefully I don't get it wrong for them. <laughs> yeah. um, so for them, they focus more on enabling, I think, business payments on chain. Yeah, so invoicing, payouts, uh, from what I understand, that's what they are mostly focused on. Uh, more of token workflows. For us, I think it's more of the after that. Yeah, so once you have uh, digital assets on your books, or let's say your NFT game, uh, you have some sort of on-chain revenue by default, right? Nothing to do with payments, but it's just some sort of on-chain revenue they are getting. Um, how do you reconcile that to your normal books? Yeah, so that's kind of our, our role in that space. Yeah, so Request is actually more, more like a payment partner for us, yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, I just wanna jump into the last one because I noticed it's only one minute left. I'm like, do we really have one minute left? <laughs> okay, I thought we were, I, okay. So the next one, like one of the issues uh, uh, in the space, right, it's actually interoperability, right? I have to go from one bridge to the other bridge, you know, like, a, you know, like one wallet to the other wallet, keep switching between them sometimes, I don't even know on what network I am, what am I swapping, you know, like after 10, 15 steps, I forgot what I was meant to do, right? So in this case, how do we make inter interoperability easier? I mean, like we have few protocols sitting down on the wallets, providers and protocols sitting on this panel itself. What, what do you feel should be the steps for inter, uh, improving interoper interoperability? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because that's probably one of the, you know, the pain point for, for a lot of crypto users because when you come onto Web3, there are a lot of applications you want to use. Sometimes you might easily lose yourself. I think recently there are a few technologies that really came into my mind that I think can solve this issue, which is the combination of account abstraction and gas abstraction. What that means is essentially you can pay the gas without owning the native currency. So let's say I'm on Polygon, I supposedly I need to pay my tech as my gas. But with gas abstra abstraction, I can pay USDT, maybe on Binance Smart Chain, and then boom, the transaction just went through. So in that case, I don't really need to know which blockchain I'm in. As long as I have that, I can pay the gas, things went through, I'm all good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, basically, we, we operate a uh, bridge called Messina, um, which is a bridge between Algorand and EVMs. And that's our belief, actually, that, that this, this is kind of following the trend of the Internet, right? In the early days of the Internet, there was a lot of information out there, but you didn't know where to find it. So you'd go to the places like Yahoo or AltaVista Excite or something like this, and, and it wasn't great. And then Google came about, and now you can find information. Maybe there's too much information. The same thing's happening on Web3. Mm. You know, there's... there's not, there's a lot of stuff out there, and unless you're following all the, all the blogs and all the Twitter spaces and all these things, you don't even know it exists, right? And so you have one wallet on, let's say, Ethereum or Polygon, and you know kind of a couple of applications of Polygon, nothing else. That problem is going to be solved by interoperability, and sooner or later, it will be, not be a case of which blockchain you're on. It won't matter anymore. It will be, hey, I want to do this thing. Here's an application that does that thing and I can use it, and it doesn't matter where my funds are, and that's basically where we're going. I think whatever you mention is just going to give all the spammers and all the bots to actually really enjoy themselves in blockchain, but still, I think we'll go, we can figure it out later. But thank you very much for the panel. Actually, I really enjoyed it. Do we have questions from Slido? No? Okay, yeah. Ah, okay, that's really far. When a wallet access becomes easy and seamless, does that increase the risk of wallet hacks and uh, digital security? Actually, it usually it does. <laughs> so, so you always, when it, whenever you actually try to, uh, uh, for example, reduce, like for example, hardware wallets is usually the most secure way of actually storing your keys. Then when you go towards browser, it is a bit easier to hack compared to a hardware wallet, but it's still good enough. But when you start going something like Magic Link, as I said, you close one AWS service, it's all shut down. So as seamless as you usually make it, you will trade off something, right? So there's always trade-offs. When you, you make it a bit easier, more convenient, much easier to keep your keys, keep your keys in the cloud, you get hacked easily. Right. Sorry, I heard a different opinion. Yeah, sure. I think Go ahead. 
Me Actually, too. it can be more secure as well. Like just just thirty seconds. Sorry, because we know we now have like MPC multi-party comp computation. So before this, we have one only one key. So that's the entire single point of failure. When you lose it, you let lose entire thing. But now we can break the one key into three keys. So one key is being managed by your email. One key you can upload that to Google Drive or whatsoever. And then one key can be kept by the wallet, uh, like a smear wallet. So in that case. If you lose your key, it's okay. We can help you to recover it. And if people hack one of your key, it's still fine because we still keep two of the key. Unless both of the key got hacked, then you're gone. Yeah, so as you I said, we're going to take this offline. <laughs> <laughs> we have come to the end of this episode. We hope you've learned much from the biggest trailblazers in the industry. See you in the next TechStorm Insight, where we will hear from other showstoppers around the world.